This is the Honky Tonk Man, the greatest intercontinental champion of all time, saying tune in to In Your Head Online. Check it out. Great website. Great stuff on there. All right. We're back. Welcome to In Your Head Wrestling Radio. I'm the internet icon, handsome Jackie Jones, along with my right-hand man. Well, Jack, that would make me one-inch biceps, the power goat, Bob. It was, a, it was a very mundane Bob, but I will let it pass. <laughs> and uh, joining us right off the bat here, Inchman. Mm-hmm. I had to, I had to get sophisticated for our guest here. Yes, yes. He's a former arm wrestling champion. Uh, he's in uh, over the top. Oh no, it's the wrong guest. We have from Kayfabe Commentaries, Sean Oliver on the line. You made me the curtain jerker tonight. What's up with that? Oh man. I feel te- I, 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 I Actually, I think that sometimes. I overthink everything, but I think, well, is the guest going to think, uh, you know, they're they're opening the show? Does that mean uh, the other person's the main event? And, uh, yeah, all that. Because generally, as a people, as a society, we're never happy, are we? We're That's- always complaining. Oh, yeah, this this show was too short. Okay, here's a piper that's three and a half hours. Oh, it's so long. He slurs occasionally. You know, he's been punched in the mouth for 47 years. Oh, yeah, but he slurs. He, oh, he told a story that involved 1983. That wasn't 1984. Someone's always got something to say, don't they? Yes, they do. And I, I was, uh, that, that, that's uh, too bad because I really, I, I generally like all the kayfabe commentary uh, DVDs. In uh, videos and but this one I, I thought really stood out. I thought it, I I thought it was to my knowledge probably my favorite of the uh, the timelines. I loved it too. And uh, as it was being cut, I um, I got more and more excited about it. You know, you you do the thing live, and then it it kind of goes away for a little bit from your from one's psyche. Because you're off editing other stuff and, you know, doing the packaging artwork, et cetera, for maybe five titles before you get to release what you just shot. So it goes away for a little bit, and then then it comes back. And when it comes back, that's kind of the litmus test for me. Because when I'm sitting there in the chair... I'm not always aware as a viewer how things are going. I am trying to sit there as a viewer. The interview is always best when I am totally the audience in my mind. But occasionally you've got to leave from being an audience member and be a director and worry about the light and the angle and uh, timing and, you know, getting on to the next segment and all that stuff. Um, But then when I sit down to look at the raw footage uh, as we start the cut that's when I can be a viewer again and totally a viewer um, a viewer with control which is even better so when Pipers came up again I, I thought it was great I, I really did it, it is getting mostly positive feedback I'm just yeah. being a little uh, facetious for the, the few things I read here and there were you know, somebody you know watches Spartacus and, and goes, "Yeah, all well, that scene with four thousand extras." I saw one guy who looked at the camera. I mean, give me a fucking break. Right, and just I think it's human nature. Uh, even though it's uh, mostly positive, the ne- the negative stuff does stick out in your brain when you read it. At least it does for me. Oh no, you can't give it that much power for God's sake. Mm-hmm. You know, I, there's, a, it, there's, a, there's something complimentary about it. Here's the arc, and I don't know if you guys have been doing this a very long time also, so uh, listen to us a very long time. It's a significant amount of time for the medium of digital media, which I think everything's got a shelf life of equivalent to a housefly. Um, a lifespan, I should say, equivalent to a housefly. Um, when you first come out, and you're different, and you're new, and you're doing things, you know, a little differently, like people didn't see it, you, 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 they can't heap enough praise on you. You are the underdog that they're going to get behind, and you get such a loyal following. And then after you've been working for a while and you you establish yourself, you, you go and look at, like, the establishment a little bit. And then there's just kind of that natural anti-establishment vibe that has to happen. But you hope that there's enough loyal constituents to drown out uh, the naysayers. So sometimes I do kind of feel like, you know, 
Metallica being told we sold out now. You know, like, hey, man, we're here. We were the garage band. We're, we're no different. But there's that thing where when you're successful and things take off and catch on and your legions go from hundreds to thousands, people need to buck that a little bit. And I think that's okay. Keeps you honest. Yeah. And not, I, you know, not just because you, you come on the show a lot and stuff, but I've always said that uh, in my, I, I stand by, I, I think it's head and shoulders above all the other ones as far as uh, shoot interviews go, the KPIP commentary ones are just much have, better all around in, in the content and uh, in the actual, you know, the look of it and the editing, everything about it. I have to agree with you. Good. You should have confidence in it. And, you know, you brought up saying that you did like it, and I really – someone actually brought up a question on the board, which I thought was kind of funny. We'll ask that later. But um, I really noticed that uh, you look extremely happy to be next to Piper. Oh, well, was I sporting wood? <laughs> I was not looking that closely. I think the camera shots at least up, but I'm, I'm not positive. No. You know why? Because occasionally we get a guest. Yeah. Not that not that you look sad like normally, but it just seemed like a you know it's like <laughs> someone who grew up you know uh, you know like it's this guy that you grew up watching and you're doing this you you look very you didn't see, you didn't see me loading the gun during the you shoot China you mean? <laughs> I think Incher did that when we had um, we had the Cuban assassin. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Good the Lord. Cuban assassin! You need him on kayfabe commentary. Yeah, the Cuban have, assassin. Yeah, Fidel he'll have, Sierra. He'll have some fake people calling in. <laughs> Why do you got that there Cuban on the show? <laughs> oh my! God. You know what? Though I, I was happy to have Piper on because, uh, selfishly, a little bit that era, the the '80s WWE stuff. That's really what I grew up on, late 70s, early 80s, WWF, WWE. Um, so there's a lot that I wanted to get to the bottom of to satiate my own mm -hmm. uh, curiosity. And um, so, yeah, so I was thrilled to, to, to have the man there that, that was a part of, of a lot of it. And also, boy, that term legend is really thrown around a lot now by WWE. And I guess I'm to accept the fact that Roddy Piper and Hillbilly Jim are legends on the same par. I guess as a society, we have to accept that. Mm -hmm. But I know better. And um, I know how much Piper was responsible for um, in, in the 80s. Just those few years, 84, I'd say, to 86, mm -hmm. which was when the, it was really the hammering of the foundation for what was to come. Piper was responsible for a lot of what was going on. He was the counter. He was the um, the opposite to Hogan and 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 all things good and mighty. He was always behind the villainous activities. So naturally, unless you have a strong heel, you don't have a strong face. I mean, we us smarts are um, intelligent enough to know that by now. So, yes, I was happy on many counts to be talking to Roddy Piper for this company. Interesting, bro, uh, you know, uh, building the foundation, because I really got that sense when, when uh, during the uh, during the U shoot because uh, the timeline, because I didn't realize, you know, until there, you guys started saying, like, all those guys came in the same year. It was Hogan and Mean Gene and Piper, and I was like, wow, that's really when they built, you know, started to build what became WWF. You had Dr. D. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul Orndorff, Hulk Hogan, Eugene Oakland on the stick, um, Bobby Heenan, yeah. Piper. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that that core that core group. Now, okay, of, of these names I mentioned, let's say you had to let's say we had like a board game here, and we had a, a, a few pegs, and we're, we're plugging in those pegs there in 83, early 84. We have all those names we're plugging in. Now we're going to skip a bunch of blank stuff, which is called, you know, 1984, February, March, April, May, all the way to the end. But the other peg we're going to fill in is WrestleMania. And I'm going to tell you what the significance of a WrestleMania is, because it doesn't exist yet, because this is a game we're playing. And I say, yeah, there's going to be this thing called WrestleMania. It starts a trend where for the next 30 years, 
every year this this massive event that would go on to become this on this thing called pay per view, which doesn't really exist yet, but but it's going to. And you could people will pay fifty dollars from the house just to watch it. Yeah, I know you can watch wrestling for free. I know that, but there's going to be a day. Trust me, when you pay fifty bucks to watch this thing, and it's going to start right here, right, and put this peg right here in 1985. Now. Here are your wrestlers, 84, let's go all the way to the other end of that little pegboard there. Here are the wrestlers. Who are the guys that are going to be able to go through this year and make that first event happen? You're going to pull out the Dr. B peg? Are you going to pull out the Orndorff peg? Are you going to pull out the, the uh, who else did I mention? Um, no, it's the Piper peg. There's Piper and Hogan. And we sprinkled some garnish in there. We got Mr. T involved, Cindy Lauper. But what was the backbone? It was Hogan and Piper. I've seen people debate on the Internet, too. Like, oh, Piper Hogan didn't draw nearly as much money as Orndorff and Hogan. The money that was drawn by Piper and Hogan wasn't just the times they wrestled each other. It was the whole Cindy Lauper thing, which was the whole Moolah thing. Tell me the last time... That many people tuned in to watch a, a, a ladies match. Mm-hmm. I think the rating was a nine. Yeah. For 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 friggin' the fabulous Mola. Uh-huh. So and and the backbone of that, Piper and Hogan. Mm-hmm. Piper and Hogan was the foundation for what happened in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a that. You know, I know the same thing with the Orn because I know that Orndorff Hogan match. I think it still holds a record for most. I don't know if it's outdoor, indoor, or whatever. But like I said, that's like one match where people would go to see. But it's different between that and like a whole era of wrestling. Drawn, you know. Well, add up that add up that gate for that. For however many people went to the big event in Canada, add up that gate next to WrestleMania One's gate. And ask you do the garden and the felt form, do every theater in the United States, do every videotape that was sold after that, compare the two gates. If you just want to use the one date and you want to throw out the whole water, settle the score and, and city law, all that, you want to throw that all out and just compare the two events. WrestleMania's gate is, 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 goes to pay-per-view, it goes to yeah. uh, videotape, DVD, all of it. Mm-hmm. Now, are you surprised uh, to see Piper in Legends House with Pat Patterson? After some of things uh, he meant. Well, I watched Legends House, having known, of course, what was in the the edition of Timeline, mm-hmm. and I don't think I've seen them interact once. Have they? Am I wrong? I think you're right. I, they have not. I know. Uh, you know, when they're drinking, Piper went in the other room in the first. I haven't seen the second episode yet. Inter- I don't think there is has been any interaction. No, I, I right. can't. I can't recall any in the second uh, episode. When uh, I saw him do a comment on uh, uh, stand up um, in Atlanta, I think it was yeah Atlanta this uh, last year, this year, mm-hmm. and he gave away so he did some um, what there were spoilers at the time for Legends House, and it was it was odd to me because uh, well first of all it's in front of a horror movie crowd, it was at a horror convention, yeah. and it's weird because he's telling stories about guys that I didn't think uh, a lot of people would even know, but yet it still gets reaction fr- from that crowd. But one of the things he talked about was uh, Patterson coming out of the closet, and I thought it was very... I don't know if that's how they're going to play it up on Legends House, that he comes out of the closet, no one knew about it, but I don't know. We'll find out. Jesus, that's a closet with a, with a glass door. I mean, <laughs> is there anyone that doesn't know what's in that closet? Yeah, I, it, was, uh, it was very odd, I thought. But have you ever have you ever got to uh, see Piper in stand-up? No, I don't. I don't know that I'd like that. It's not exactly stand up. It's basically kind of him telling, uh, almost like a one man show where he t- he tells stories of. Uh, well, that's di- that's different. That that might be anything. When guys that are good storytellers and good speakers and engaging speakers, sometimes they move to stand up, and it's stand up's a very different thing. Most of the stand up comics that have been successful, the comedians, mm-hmm. comedians in general, even uh, actor comedians. They're not very engaging and outgoing in their daily life when they're not performing. It's almost an inverse relationship. Mm -hmm. Because people who are engaging talkers, it's a different thing because it is it is a scripted thing to get up there and perform the same joke a hundred times and 
to be able to sound entertaining, to be able to punch it at the right point and make it sound like it's the first time you're saying it. One, I saw Ron Jeremy do stand-up once. Ron is an engaging guy. He's fun to talk to, and he's a funny guy in the whole sit next to him at a party and talk and joke kind of funny. But in a structured stand-up setting, he was awful. And I was shocked because I was that whole, like, oh, Ron is going to be hilarious. Yeah, he's a great story. He's just funny. Think about all the shit he's got to talk about. And it wasn't. It was like a fart up there. So I, I wonder how Piper would be. I'd be nervous. What did you think? Um, I've seen him uh, do th- I've seen it three times, actually. Um, one was at a, a wrestling convention. Two were at horror conventions. And the first two I saw I thought were great. Um, the third one, I, did, I just felt he wasn't, um, wasn't a good day for him. He kind of rambled a little bit and didn't finish some of the stories. But the, uh, the other two times, I, but uh, most of the crowd loved it anyway. But I, it is yeah. different. He does. It is different. It's not him telling jokes. It is uh, him telling stories from the road, you know, wrestling stories. And, uh, you know, he'll talk about Mad Dog Vachon and, you know, all these different stories. It's a, it is different than just, like, stand-up. It's, you know, stories from his life. It's uh, very similar um, to, um, oh, what's it? I forget the guy's name. He's a comedian. He did a one-man show, um, John Leguizamo. Billy Crystal? Yeah, John Leguizamo. It's similar to, 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 uh, to his show, if you've ever seen it. Tougher to get a date if you're at a wrestling convention with a belt or at a horror convention dressed as a sleet stack from the land of the lost. Totally the the wrestling. The the horror movie con- horror <laughs> conventions there's there's tons of uh, tons of females there who are mm-hmm. into who are dressed in, in costumes. The very wrestling good. convention yeah. you're hard pressed to find a female. <laughs> that is very true. That's true. That's true. And the ones that are there you got you got to wonder. <laughs> that is also true. That's also true. Uh, do you own do you, do you own a t- belt? Do you ever walk around with like a kayfabe commentary? <laughs> I don't know if this is a loaded question. <laughs> we had the company make a custom. No, we didn't have. Them. They contacted us. They were fans, and they do the belt. I'm going to think of the name of the company in a sec. I don't want to be rude, mm-hmm. but it will come to me. And they make. I mean, that's their their thing. I mean, they make professional belts for wrestling organizations. They said. You know, they wanted to do one for us. They said that's an amazing, beautiful belt. It says uh, Wrestling Media World Champion. has our logo in the middle and on the side of the strap where, you know, the flags used to be in the old NWA belts are the logos of all of our shows. So in my office on top of a case, there is the Wrestling Media World Champion belt, which makes me such a bitch-ass mark. It's unbelievable. I love but it. They reached. They reached out to us. The wild. I think it's Wildcat. Wildcat. Yeah, yeah. As I when I thought about getting it in your head title, that was uh, that was one. <laughs> I was, that was, uh, <laughs> they 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 do uh, awesome work. They I, they do a lot of stuff for like because uh, I've seen they have like a hot dog eating one and a wa- the Waffle House belt. I think is my favorite. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to to acquire that one next year, <laughs> yeah. and uh, as I take on as I take on Kenny Bowling. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> how did how did uh, people react to the uh, to the ICP uh, you shoot? Uh, depends what people. Mm-hmm. Um, the people that I hope uh, to invite in to the KFA commentaries world loved it. Um, you know what? I, I shouldn't say that. Even the fans that were shit talking it before it came out, we got a lot of those. You know, I really didn't think I was going to like this, but kind of reviews, which is always good to see. Um, despite whether you think they're worthy of, of, you know, the same place in wrestling history as Lou says and the Harley Race. I mean, if we're going to sit here and debate that, that's one thing. But they were participants in the business. They're fans like you wouldn't believe of wrestling. Um, I mean, while they were doing music, try to break into music, they were doing backyard stuff and, and you know, running local shows and trying to, to, to learn the business because they loved it. Mm. And because they had that little ticket in with music, they were able to work in all the major federations. So I think 
they had a worthy play, and, and it was you shoot for God's sake. I didn't do a timeline with them. We do guest book or violent J. We did you shoot, <laughs> so it it, it 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 followed. It's consistent with what you shoot is, and and I thought they were fine additions to the show. They were very entertaining. I thought it was a fun show. I enjoyed. Everyone it. I talked to liked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. I liked I like those guys anyway. We've had them. Yeah, we've had Jay on the show. But I do think uh, they came off uh, they came off well on it too. Like it showed that they they really do love wrestling, like you just said, and um, and yeah, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. Or it was uh, I really enjoyed it. I no, tell- they know what's up. I mean, for anyone that thinks that 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 they thought they should have been, you know, world champions, and they they know their place in this, and they were thrilled just to be a part of it, to be working with guys like Hogan and. And Goldberg and everything. They were they were they were thrilled as fans, you know. What was the intro? Um, I was just going to say I totally watch a guest booker with a uh, Violent J. <laughs> <laughs> you could always do uh, timeline. Imagine that. Shit, wrestle. Imagine that. <laughs> I would be curious. What would we have? What would we have in book? Hmm. Hmm. What would be? A, what would be a good? Uh, huh. I'll have to think about that one. If anyone here, could probably call it could be called Gosh. Um, um, I'm being jocular, of course. Uh huh. But you know what? They're fans. They'd be all over that shit if we gave them that to do. Yeah, that would be great. We got some questions here in the in the um, chat room. Here, intro. If you want to ask any. Okay, I had one from the message board. T. C. Anderson. He wants to know what are the three top uncomfortable moments you've had on film. Uh. Top three uncomfortable m- on on camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I think when Tony Atlas unveiled a life size cutout of China <laughs> that he was walking around with. <laughs> and I mean, how's that? How's that stuff you don't see coming? When he goes into a bag and says, "Hey, look what I got here!" and there it is, <laughs> and then and then some some eight by some glossy eight by tens of of her and glossy eight by tens of the boots. I think what I said at that point, I said, "Did you did you hit a China store on the way here?" Because the stuff was so accessible to Tony Alex. He was very excited about it. <laughs> that was interesting. I think anything during anything during the Jamie Dundee show <laughs> mm-hmm. could qualify. As uncomfortable. I was kissed by him about ten times. We could start there. I think he was twerking me at one point, grinding into my chair for some reason. Not sure why. Uh-uh. Auditioning for Legends House, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> um, so anything from that show was, was pretty uncomfortable. Um, yeah, that, that's a good start, I think. Yeah. There's uh, some more here, and uh, this one is good because uh, Brain wants Brains wants to know: um, Do you think uh, how big is Lord Alfred Hayes' dick will become a, a regular question on these shoots? You know what? It won't last long because everyone's got the answer to it. Apparently, it's worked in the '80s uh, or the '70s. That's very true. There's no mystery to it. No, it's not. I mean, you see the on you see, you know, Michael Myers' face right away. It's it's not. There's no there's no tease to it. Yeah. Um, are you happy with uh, the breaking uh, kayfabe uh, line? The, uh, the, with the series? Yeah. Because it's, yeah, I am. it's different than, than, than your other things. It is. Um, we, we'd, we'd not uh, paid much attention to... Um, with the exception of you, Shoot, and... and, and and you should be dependent on the questions we get from the fans, obviously. So we don't spend a lot of time on the out-of-the-ring uh, activities of some of the people in the business. And this is a business rife with the most colorful characters in the world. Um, some get into trouble. Some are just wild and crazy. Um, some of the other shooting interviews out there, as you might have noticed, spend an inordinate amount of time on the, cra- on the, on the crash TV element of, um, of what goes on. Um, we don't really. So this is our opportunity to to touch that a little bit, um, and, and but 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 from a serious vein, not an exploitative vein. I mean, that's that's the line that we always have to um, to to try and skirt. You, you know, 
when it goes towards ridicule or or or, or something like that, it, it is really an honest discussion. I mean, that was the pitch, just a real honest discussion between myself and people with really storied lives, and then just to see where it goes. And you know, the first guests we well, we we did Waltman first, and then um, we moved to um, New Jack and. So it, it was just to see what would happen if, if, if we were allowed honest discussion with those, those types of people, where it would go. And I think it's, I think it's succeeded thus far. Mm-hmm. I was really a big fan of the, uh, the Waltman and the, and the New Jack one. And I thought, uh, I thought you uh, did a, a great job on it, too. I thought it really showcased your, uh, your interview style. On which one? On the series? On the, on the Wal- Waltman and the New Jack one in particular. Uh, oh, well, thank you. Well, I agree with you. Oh yeah, you know, I will say the only one I felt uh, was a little hard to watch was uh, the Marty Jannetty one. I didn't feel it was a little hard. Not oh because, gosh, not because, uh, Marty. The- we shot. A, well, let me think for a minute. We shot two hours and a half with Marty. We cut it down to what is an intelligible. One hour and ten minute conversation. Uh-huh. Intelligible, as intelligible as it can be. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a beginning, middle, and end to stuff that's discussed. You know, I had to, at the ten minute mark, zoom back, zoom back to the, uh, if I'm at the ten minute mark in a discussion about baked beans, sometimes I had to jump ahead to the one hour and twenty seven minute mark to Get where we went back to the baked beans story, and then we right passed it right back where it should be at the 10-minute mark. There was a lot of work done to make it look presentable. I'm not saying... I couldn't have released it. Mm-hmm. Couldn't have released it in its original form. Uh-huh. And since then, Marty has become upset because, quote-unquote, because he heard how much I edited, mm-hmm. I did a hatchet job and made him look bad. So he wanted more. Exactly. He wanted more baked beans. In his, uh... <laughs> if anyone who fo- I, I like Marty Journey, but anyone who follows him on Facebook, um, I don't know how to say this, but he doesn't really need any help in looking bad. And if you read a lot of his posts, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, so. ridiculous. I, I like Marty. Uh huh. Um, I, I I I was blown away by. My dealings with him after the release of that show, I really was in shock at at, at accusations being hurled at me in, in, in making him look bad. And uh, I wish Marty well. Yeah. Do you come? Do you? Does that happen often? Where you'll put something out and someone will will bring up that uh, either you cut something out or they think you edited it in a way that that kind of manipulated what they said. Not at all. Uh, this was the only time. Oh well, that's that's excellent. Oops. And uh, and believe me, any editing that was done uh, was done uh, to enhance mm-hmm. the uh, intelligibility of the discussion and uh, to make it fallible, for God's sakes. Mm-hmm. There was uh, the breaking cafe by Jim Cornette one. Um, I did. Uh, when you were doing that, there was a couple times where you looked at him, and I was I I thought you almost looked a little uh, scared. Did you feel that at all when when you were doing that? There's a couple times he looked very angry in that one, like a no. differently than, than he normally does. No, Jim doesn't scare me yeah, or worry anymore. Worried maybe was a better better term. No, it was. I think what I feared was how long we were going. I think I was fearing <laughs> running out of space on the hard drive. That's probably the fear that was in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Jim had a lot to get off his chest that day. I think that was the first time he really opened up about uh, Ring of Honor. So there was, yeah, I, there was there was certainly an agenda. Yeah, I brought that up on the show, and for people who haven't checked that out yet, if you want to uh, hear a lot of different stories from Jim Cornette on um, something you know you don't always hear him talk about. That one has a lot about uh, Ring of Honor. Yeah, I, I definitely. It, it was a bit of a break. Mm-hmm. For, he even says on the show one time, I think, uh, said, I've never had a substance abuse problem. Uh, you know, I don't uh, have any incest in my family or anything like that. I don't know that I'm a good guest for the show. But then you let him, you watch him ramble maniacally 
for two and a half hours, and you say, yeah, he's the perfect guest for the show. He says himself, I'm not crazy, I'm wrestling crazy. And that counts. You can be on break case if you're wrestling crazy. Yeah. I do think uh, that one kind of showcased that wrestling is a major part of uh, Jim Cornette's life. And uh, Yeah, you think? Get away from that. But, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I know it's going out on the limb and it's astute observation, but I believe that uh, wrestling is a part of Jim Cornette's life. Um. I got a question for you. How do you feel about all, all those remakes that were happening of those classic horror films? Like, uh, not just classic, classic, but the new classic, like like Halloween and Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, Are those I, sacred properties that should be left alone? That comes up a lot on, um, on on Without Your Head, which, by the way, is live tomorrow night with um, with Nicholas Vince, who plays Chatterer in uh, in the Hellraiser film. But um, so wow. yeah, the uh, remakes. Um, I, I don't have a problem with remakes because if, uh, uh, in general, a lot of people just hate remakes at all. But I would say if you did, if it wasn't for remakes, you wouldn't have had uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The second one was really good. Uh, wouldn't have had um, John Carpenter's The Thing, which is fantastic. But they are just it's insane with the amount of remakes. And to remake something, I think that is so like this still like in people's mind and still out there because they're actually remaking Cabin Fever, which is. Uh, this came out like ten years ago. <laughs> Stick that. It's like, yeah. Well, there was. We needed another shot at it. Is what we need. Yes. But uh, yeah, to remake, it's it's hard to remake something too, like uh, like a Nightmare on Elm Street, because that character is iconic. The guy plays him still alive, and I just uh, I did think it was smart when they remade um, um, which I didn't think was going to be good at first. Evil Dead. Because they didn't use Ash, and I know a lot of people was against that originally, but I figured if you remade Evil Dead and you included Ash, there'd be no way it was going to live up to people's memory of the original Ash, so they just actually didn't use that character. So I thought that was a smart way to do it. But overall, you know, it's insane with the amount. The, uh, the, the character interpretations don't bother me about remakes. Like, yeah, hell, man, if you can give me a, an interesting wrinkle on Freddy Krueger, Mm-hmm. I mean, even though I've got the Robert England Freddy Krueger in my head, the early one, when he got funny and stupid later on, whatever, but, you know, early Freddy, um, if, if you can give me a new take on that, that's cool. The thing that I fear with those is, and I know we're getting way off topic, but um, a movie like Halloween, mm-hmm. where in its simplicity as a film, the subtle, the most subtle atmospheric things... Um, the way the shots were set, some of those long shots, Michael Myers all the way across the street, and, you know, uh, the, of course the piano, and created such an atmosphere. It was beyond the characters and the stabbing and, and, and all that stuff. The fear of Michael Myers, it was an atmosphere. It's like when you step into a room and you can feel something, whether it's tension or, or a great party or a great vibe, that movie had such atmosphere. It's the hardest thing for movies to replicate because so much time on a set is spent on the stuff, you know, oh, uh, this special effect, we've got to get the camera here and da 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 and those lines and let's get a close-up and da da But unless you're shooting on a shoestring budget and you're someone like John Carpenter who's basically editing the thing in his head as he's shooting it because it costs whatever, you know, mm-hmm. under a million dollars, right? like something like $500,000, um, then you're not thinking of a big picture like that, of atmosphere. What's this going to feel like, this shot? So that's the toughest thing to duplicate. And I I don't know that they can ever get that stuff. The Texas Chainsaw was the same way. That had a very, very eerie atmosphere to it. The graininess of the film has something to do with it. It's all of it. The original um, Halloween, um, a lot of people have said, uh, we've interviewed in other interviews, that um, when when they would show the cut, before they added the music, a lot of people were like, what is this? There's, you know, there's really nothing here. But when they added the music, um, which obviously he did, he, uh, he did the score himself, John Carpenter. But so he, he knew that, like you said, in his head, when he's, when he's filming the movie and stuff, how, how that's going to add to the atmosphere. And once that was added, then people really saw, you know, how scary this movie was. And so it was, yeah. Also, I think the original Halloween, what the, the new one, really just missed was in the original Halloween, the kid, you never, he's, he's from a good family. So you can, anyone can relate to that. If you just live in a regular neighborhood that just someone, you know, your neighbor can go crazy. Whatever, for whatever reason can start killing people. 
in the remake, he was from a bad home, so it made sense that he became a killer. And I think that really lost the whole point mm. of, the, of the first one. He's a giant guy, and so he's intimidating but on his own without a mask or anything. And the first one's just a normal person, which uh, I think that makes it scarier because you can, you know, you can just think anyone you know around here could, could be a killer. Yeah. Is, is, is your chat board filled with, oh, great, what is coming next? Cat people? I'm logging off. Is that what it says on, on the board? No, actually, let's see here. Who's your highway? Uh, uh, the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the worst piece of shit ever. Uh, he did hmm. like Evil Dead remake. Um, Dirty Sanchez he says it needed CGI and explosions, which I, I assume that is being facetious, I hope, anyway. Uh huh. Perhaps he meant. Uh, maybe perhaps he meant timeline needs a uh, needs some CGI and explosions. I don't know. <laughs> yes, we. Greg, I'll tell you one thing. Greg Valentine could use a little dynamite slipped under his chair here or there. <laughs> I could just see somebody's like answer being off the wall, and Sean just looks at the camera, and his head explodes like in scanners. <laughs> scanners, exactly. That would. Be I'm a I'm a mark for that old shit. <laughs> yeah, that's the best stuff. No, I'm surprised. Joe Spinell. Should there be an, an annual Joe Spinell award given out? Just like the creepiest man alive. I would. Uh, yeah, that'd be awesome, Joe Spinell. I What's think up? the career. I think the career trajectory. I'm not sure it was Godfather, <laughs> Maniac. Isn't that? Isn't that kind of how it went? <laughs> yeah, I think. I think he's also in his small bit in Rocky. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're right. He is in. Okay. Well. Okay. Okay. I mean, we're talking. All right. Godfather. Rocky Maniac. Mm-hmm. Just, I'm uh, just checking that. Have you seen the remake of uh, Maniac? Uh, no, who's in that? I, I know that one. That's uh, um, Frodo uh, or Bilbo Baggins. The ki- What's the, the, ki- the kid? Yeah. Uh, uh, Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I haven't. I, it's it's there on my Netflix. I never... I'll you know, be honest. I, I It's totally different from the Joe Spinell one, obviously. Um, but they actually worked that into the story and it's not perfect, but I did like it quite a bit. I was very surprised by it. Does, does at any point Tobey Maguire reference his role in The Godfather during the remake of, of Rocky? Did he say, Cheech, Cheech is going to get it at midnight? Is that line in there anywhere? You must have questions for me. Come on. Yes. Uh, is there any more from the uh, message board? I have uh, one from Change Man off the message board. He wants to know, have you ever reconciled with Conan? Uh, no, because he's never paid. <laughs> mm. When someone rob when someone robs you, usually there's usually no reconciliation until they pay. And, and to date, that's the only uh, person that that's happened with. Um. Yeah, we've had cancellations, uh, but he's the only one that I was foolish enough to 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 give a deposit on a book. No, I shouldn't say that. I've deposited people before, um, but uh, yeah, it was kind of a weird deal. He he was scheduled to come in to do some other appearances too, and and those people got screwed worse than us. I think we lost five hundred bucks or something like that. But Schroeder, who actually brought him in, bought, uh, was was supposed to bring him in, had the plane, the round trip plane ticket, uh, you know, the hotel and all that stuff, but he just never got on the plane. Um, and it, it was actually rescheduled from him canceling six months prior. So you live, you learn, you know, you look for the, you look for the lesson in it and mm. you know, you maybe you'll need my blood type someday and then there's the opportunity for revenge. <laughs> Uh, Mike Terry on the Facebook, uh, first his comment is, uh, could you let uh, Sean know that I'm a huge fan of the Piper timeline, and I'm really looking forward to the Shane Helms you shoot. And Aussie says, uh, Sean Oliver is one of my favorite guests on In Your Head, and he wants to know, is there any wrestler alive and not in prison who he would refuse to work with for whatever reason, no matter how many copies of their you, you shoot, kayfabe commentaries might be able to sell? Uh, after the Scott Hall incident, I wasn't too interested in working with Scott. I would today, but after he crashed the uh, roast and attacked the comedian, I thought it best to stay away from him. Um, yeah, there. Uh, I was offered Jim Neidhart a few times, um, but there's a. I know there were, I and mean, perhaps there aren't anymore, some reliability issues with Jim and airplanes um, and speaking on 
camera at times. Um, so uh, I elected to stay away from that. Um, I I shut a shoot down once because uh, the talent was completely uh, zonked and could barely talk. And I can't put a product out like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's you cannot charge money uh, for something that is compromised like that. Now, was and that he, and, mm-hmm. and, what's that? I was say, was that one already set up? You don't say who it is, but was it already set up and you were going to film it and they were like that, or was it like in negotiations you could tell? Or? I'll say the whole thing <clears throat> without using the individual's name because he may have cleaned up and yeah, you know, parole, off, parole officer wouldn't want to hear it. Or, um, we, we were... <laughs> We were, uh, we shot, we shot two that day. It was a double shot. We had just wrapped up Liney Poffel's Breaking Kayfabe, which was a glorious time. It was great, great shoot, great show. Uh, we wrapped up. Uh, the other wrestler was already checked in and at his hotel. And I said, you know, I would send word when uh, our driver was going to go pick him up and uh, bring him. And I sent. I'd been in communication a couple of times, called him when he got in and texted him and said he was going to head down to the uh, to the hotel bar and we could pick him up there. And uh, so I start getting texts back from my guys that, uh, you know, having a hard time, he's, uh, you know, he's not in a good way. And believe it or not, Jake the Snake, who was on the mend at the time, still is, I guess, was the one at the bar who was helping the guys try to get this guy in shape and, and ready to go. And Jake, Jake was helping out in an incredible reversal of roles. I actually started the Jake Roberts uh, breaking kayfabe with this story before uh, he didn't want to talk about anything interesting. And I said, you can leave. And he did. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but Jake was being helpful and being like, yeah, I got to get this guy straight now, man. And, and, you know, and so I get a call. My phone rings and Brian says, we got him in the car. I said, Brian, one to 10, how bad? He said, uh, 11. I said, okay. I head downstairs to the hotel lobby and in the distance from the parking deck, I see Craig and Brian are kayfabe employees carrying 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 a wrestler wrestler's arm over each of their heads you know they're on either side of them and they're dragging his feet (laughs) like he came off the battlefield (laughs) he gets yes yes it looked like a scene scene from glory Um, (laughs) except everyone was white Uh, they get in the door and I guess he, his eyes open when he's about 10 feet from a guy he had never met, but is wearing a suit. So he assumes, okay, this is the guy that's paying me. So he, he like put, like pushes the guys away. Like, you know, kayfabe's the fact that he's been, been carried for 50 yards. And I watched it, pushes both guys away, stands, goes, how you doing, man? Puts out his hand. I said, we have to sit down and talk. And I said, are, are you going to be able to do this? He's like, yeah, and no, I'll kick out. I'll kick out. I'll kick out. And we went upstairs. We rolled. I guess about, we started the show about four or five times. Uh, he did not kick out. Uh, he, he, did, he got more than Bundy's five count. He got the 500 count uh, and couldn't kick out. And uh, gave him some opportunities to get it together. It didn't happen. Um, I had to forcibly turn the lights out on him and have him carried out because he was upset. He, I guess, needed the payday. And I, I gave him a little something and said, here, take, take this, finish your weekend here. And uh, and we'll get together another time uh, when you're better. I can't put this out. I can't charge people for this. I can't have your family watch this. You know, I have a responsibility. So the stuff like that that nobody knows, mm-hmm. when I would read shit like, because Tammy came on the show and talked about the fact that she had a drug problem. Mm-hmm. And I would read, oh, ex- the exploitative, they're giving a drug addict money. Well, you know, she wasn't high there, and she was allegedly clean, and... You know, why can't she come on and tell her story? You know, I mean, is Oprah fueling a drug out of habit to have her have someone on and pay them to talk about an incident that happened? So the stuff like this that people don't know, 
um, it gets frustrating when you have to re- read that you're, you know, this uh, exploitative uh, gossip monger. Yeah. There's, uh, there's everyone now in the chat room is trying to guess who this person is. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like 20 questions now. I guess. It was no. Jackie Jones. <laughs> yes, it was. I did like that someone thought it was mean Gene Okerlund. <laughs> No, but Gene can pound him. My guys were drinking with him at the bar one night, and that's, I mean, that's no, that's a shoot, man. He's, and he's in full fucking Mean Gene all the time. Can we get another round over here? I mean, he's full out Mean Gene all the time. The, the character has assumed his body, much like the moss that uh, uh, engulfs Stephen King in Creepshow. The character of Mean Gene has completely consumed himself, and I think he, he's... So we got some extra toilet paper in the shitter here, for God's sake. I mean, at home, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's full out mean gene. And oh. that's, uh, that's the beauty of the guys in this business that get get uh, um, invaded by their character. Yeah, actually, it was um, in Charlotte a few months ago. It was at a Mad Monster party, and they had uh, – um, it was a horror movie convention. But they also had Mean Gene Oakland, uh, Hogan, Piper, and, um, and Jimmy Hart there. And uh, the night before, that, they had a panel – um, me, it was like 3 a.m. and I was in the bar with uh, Annabelle and um, and uh, Mean Gene was down there and he was uh, drinking vodka on the rocks all night, which I thought. I was going to say that panel, with the exception of Jimmy Hart, sounds like the sniff it, shoot it, drink it. I mean, that's the uh, there you go, Gene Piper and Hogan, Oofla. And he was he was the moderator of the panel and he was up all night uh, drinking, but he was uh, he was there at I think it was like 11 or noon and uh, he was he was right there ready to go. So I was like. That is my uh, that's my role model right there, Mean Gene. Oh, he's been doing it for fifty years. <laughs> Andrew, got any more questions from the board? I've also- got a question of my own. Uh, uh, would you like to done a Warrior interview? Hmm. Oh, of course. Yeah, these guys uh, like Warrior and Macho. Who? Um, well, you see, Warrior Warrior put a lot of himself out there on his own with his podcasts and his rants and stuff like that. But that was kind of un, uncontrolled strangeness. I would have loved to have been able to do like a break in case where we could sit down and do a discussion where, where it's not just somebody goes off on a tangent. Mm-hmm. Unless you're Jim Cornette, then I, I'd let him go. I just let him go. Just wind him up and point them and you let Cornette go. But the warrior, I would have loved to have had a discussion with him, try to, try to bring him in and, and pin him down on specific stuff. Mock show. <sighs> I mean, he he didn't he didn't leave us anything. He became so reclusive toward the end um, that he never opened up about anything. He 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 and and he was he was a, such a great talent too. So it's not just the guys that pass that no one gets to get tape on. It's the guys that really had it that pass, and we don't get any tape on them. I mean, to take the secrets to the grave, I guess that kind of keeps the keeps the mystery alive a little bit, but. Um, yeah, Macho, I would have loved to have had. And yeah, sure, Warrior too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember Macho. Um, before we started in your head, uh, actually, we uh, the three of us started the show. We were uh, friends on a message board of a radio show. Was uh, get in the ring, and I remember Macho Man was uh, was on there, but it was it was total kayfabe. The interview and it was you know kind of disappointing. But I can't really. I don't think I remember any uh, like uh, quote unquote shoot interview with, with Macho Man that's out there of any time. <laughs> No, I don't think, uh, and that the most insight I'd ever seen into Macho's life was was with Lanny on Breaking Kayfabe. And I think the reason Lanny opened up so much about his family, about Randy specifically, was because um, I, when I talked to him beforehand, I wanted the guest to be Lanny Paso. I didn't want the guest to be Randy Savage's brother. Right. I didn't want to talk for an hour and a half about Randy Savage. Of course it's going to come up. But I wanted the story about Randy Savage through the brother's eyes. I wanted him to talk about when he was playing baseball and the advice he used to get from Macho uh, about rounding the bases and not watching the watching the ball. But all that shit I thought was great. I mean, that stuff you're never going to get anywhere. I think that's kind of what separates us from everybody else. So I, I look for the thread that I, that, that I happen to personally to find interesting. And because I'm a fan of the genre... I'm usually right with it. Um, I look for the thread that's interesting, and, and that's kind of where we go. And and that was hope, that was what I was hoping to get from Bonnie Poffo um, with the you know the beautiful addition of of Lanny's world, which 
is a, quite a place to live with the bidet and the no toilet paper and, and all that stuff. Um, but the Randy stuff I wanted to get was that through the brother's eyes. Were, were you I ever? It was a great show. I thought so too. Um, I think Randy's actually a, um, I don't say underrated guest on on, uh, on interviews. Uh, you know, I don't know if people, you know, they don't think of maybe as like uh, Jim Cornette always comes to mind, hockey talk man and stuff, but. Uh, Landy Pop mm-hmm. is, is fantastic, and uh, he's uh, really interesting. He's always honest. He's uh, he's funny and insightful at the same time. A- yeah, he, he, yeah. I, I guess dark horse uh, sleeper kind of thing. I, I didn't think so. I, I didn't know what sales would be. I didn't know if it would be reflected in sales. Uh, that's sometimes a, a disconnect. The shows that are sometimes the most entertaining, if they don't have a marquee name, um, they're going to suffer a little bit in sales, no matter how pretty the trailer is. Um, the Tony Atlas you shoot, I to this day think is one of the most entertaining shows we've ever done. Mm-hmm. And sales wise, it doesn't hold up, you know, next to some of the other ones. But Lanny's was interesting because I knew, I know Lanny and I know he's incredibly interesting. I know if you have the right guy across from him volleying that he's going to be his, his, uh, his glorious odd self. And so I knew it was going to be great. Um, and, and it did translate into sales and that, and it, it helped give that series a boost. It really did. Um, because of the Randy stuff, um, it got a lot of trailer exposure. Um, that kind of went viral through a lot of the wrestling news sites and, and beyond. I mean, it might even hit TMZ. I'm not sure. Some of our stuff hits TMZ occasionally. And, um, so that gave that series a boost that really locked that, uh, locked breaking kayfabe in. Yeah, and it, it it we finally got the answer to the Pafo, the you know, the the party trick. And Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Gonna have to try that beats, out one of these days. Beats, beats whipping out magic, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I started DDP yoga to eventually work up to the Pafo. It'll be a right. inspirational video. But no, that that is a that is a great uh the the Laney Pafo one, and um it also I also thought it really uh, gave him a chance to explain the whole. Um, that he didn't want to be Randy in the Hall of Fame unless it was the whole family. Because I think if you hear that, like out of context, you think, well, what, what you know, why would he want that? But but when you hear him explain it, I think it it totally makes sense and it's the right thing to do. Well, for whatever reason, it, it, that's what Randy wanted. Then. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, Randy was the younger brother, and, and I mean, looked up to Randy so, and and um. I wanted to honor it. I mean, that's. I mean, Lanny's mother was also. We put a clip of her on the show, um, corroborating his story because he said he's aware of what people would say, and so he he went and he shot uh, on his own some video at his mom's house, and she told the story of how uh, that was what Randy wanted. Yeah, and I know um, even when the um, he had uh, his father put in the. Uh, in the WCW Hall of Fame, when they were doing that on the slam, the slam anniversaries, right? Yeah, so that was weird. That grudge that he was holding because Angelo was all out on the uh, uh, the Legend of Battle Royal on a house show in New Jersey, yeah. and uh, Randy wanted to get his dad on it, and uh, the powers that be in Connecticut didn't want to go. Mm-hmm. That was really what soured their relationship. It was incredible to hear that, but that was. One of the biggest confusing factors to why Randy said to Randy, I think his, his quote was, from now on, it's just business here. Mm-hmm. Now, were you ever close to uh, getting getting a, you know, you shoot or whatever you're going to uh, do you with him, but getting an interview with uh, with Randy Savage? No. No. I don't think he ever would have done it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were, I've tried, you know, I tried forever to try to get him on the show, and there was one point there was a, uh, they they had so I don't know if he had any interest, but like the person running his site or whatever his publicist or something was was trying to set it up and it never came to be. But I don't know how it would have turned out anyway. So you're in the. I don't know. Again, you, you don't know what would have shown up if he's if he's trying to case it. You don't need that for two hours. No. <laughs> so you're uh, in the chat room. Um, oh, you know, speaking of that, because uh, uh, we had. Um, the Duke of Dorchester on last week, and it was a little Thank God. and uh, which I I I kind of enjoyed anyway. But I know you talked about having you know I don't know if you want to call them jobbers, enhancement guys, or whatever. Have you have any more thought in doing uh, like a series of those or a one off? 
we would we had talked about an enhancement round table um as a one off um and we never did it but we we couldn't get the right mix of people together. There are some companies out there some it doesn't shock you. They'll just throw anybody together and roll camera and do a shoot interview. But the, the, I generally don't like ensemble shows. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to put a couple of people together, it better be for a very good reason. Um, I, I, our stuff is so... At the company here, something I stress is, is clarity of the focus of a, of a particular show. The theme has to be very clear. It can't be nebulous. There's plenty of nebulous shoots out there where people are thrown together for no goddamn apparent reason. Or it's called something, but it doesn't look or sound or, or it's not structured any differently than any, any other shoots. So um, other than just trying to emulate us, I don't know why they do it. So to put a bunch of people together, it would have to be the right mix. It would have to make sense. Obviously, if you have a tag team, we did demolition together. And, you know, okay, that, that makes sense. But... We couldn't get the right guys together for the enhancement roundtable. It would have been too, um, oh, uh, too monosyllabic. It would have been, everybody's take would have been the same in the people that we talked to. So we decided not to do it. Mm-hmm. And also, we certainly wouldn't have treated the enhancement talent disrespectfully right but it is also a stretch to, to dedicate two hours to saying they were the most important people in the wrestling business and, and that was clearly where that was going to go yeah so i don't think it would have been entertaining yeah and even in the um kind of in the name itself they might i don't know if they would take offense or just you know we're, we've got you guys all together because you guys were the enhancement talent with the name jobber you mean? yeah I don't know what even the enhancement talent. I never know what to uh, what, what to say actually when when I bring up. The- I've asked I've asked a lot of uh, a lot of uh, I think on the guest booker series I think a lot of times when that would come up I I know JJ I, I asked on camera I said well, do I mean should we did you say jobber he, every I think to a person they all said no they're jobbers because we call them jobbers yeah so I, I think maybe in hindsight uh, some of them may have looked to. Uh, play with the name to elevate themselves a little bit or, or just justify their existence. And I'm not saying that disrespectfully. I'm saying yeah. saying that in a, in a revisionist way because I think at the time in the locker room, it was probably okay to say Jabba. Mm-hmm. And I think, it's, you know, it's um, if people weren't around back then, it's a lot different than today because, like, it'll, if they don't really have Jabba matches. And if they do, they're, like, on their one show and they're gone. But a lot of those guys would be there for a long time and make a career. Because even when we had Duke Duke, uh, Duke of Dorchester last week, he talked about being there from 1973 to 1990. I mean, that's a 17-year career he had there as, you know, basically a, a job guy. So He involves one only same dentist, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, the, this, you know, the squash match is, is something that, that I miss. I, I miss that old structure. I miss turning on the television and watching – Guys, be allowed to be superheroes for a little bit. I mean, with with the the talent turnover uh, back then, you could have a guy come in, you could build him up to a monster, have a big run, pack houses. You know, in, in an eight months, he could move on. Now these guys stay forever. So if you were ever to be so insane as to try and calculate a win loss record for these guys, they're probably all five hundred. Right. And it, I mean. You've got named talent that lay down on TV, so it's it's a very different mentality now from from back then. Yeah, because you need you know people obviously need to win, and then you have like a uh, Kofi Kingston who seems to lose you know all the time. Then it's impossible to when you, if you decide like let's try to push this guy when you've just seen him lose every match on TV for you know for like a half a year. Right. But, and no one really gets over when they exchange their wins back and forth. They just kind of seem interchangeable. That's the thing, and, and your 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 main events become meaningless because they've each beaten each other twenty six times, yeah. and they're meeting for the fourth time on pay per view. I mean, really? Mm-hmm. I never got that. And but it's a different product today. It's a different product. I, we're, we're I guess around the same age, and we watched at a time where where pay per view or a blow off anyway was where two guys 
were elevated for weeks and months, um, clean records, and God, what is going to happen tonight? Who's going to go down tonight? So I think that mystery is gone. I guess people just watch for the uh, the uh, the um, the unpredictability of the of what high spot's going to come next, not mm. actually who's going to win and lose. Yeah. Although maybe the Undertaker thing changed that a little bit. I think the product in the last year has gotten more interesting. It has to me. I'm not sure why. I was thinking I, about this earlier. Yeah, I said, we said that on the show a lot of times because I was really uh, last two years I've been really down on like pretty much just watch it because they do the show and I have watched wrestling my whole life but over the last year um, it is a lot different there's there's still not perfect but there's guys that like I'm actually interested in there's the shield have been great um, I like I the Wyatt's now and I, I don't yeah, I don't know if it's a, just a, yeah I think the the Wyatt thing is great but um, I mean we know what's going to happen right I mean they're they're not going to do this and then disappear they're going to be you know they're going to turn into something ridiculous in, in a year and kind of the mystique and the the uh, John, John Carpenter element of uh, of what they're doing now is going to be gone and it's you know they'll be they'll split them up and they'll be fighting and one will put on a clown nose and it'll just become ridiculous I wish they could resist that kind of, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I realize I'm saying these guys should be put out of work <laughs> after a year <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> which is kind of a dicky thing but maybe, maybe Jarrett's thing will pop and, and they can go work there um, hopefully places will pop up and they can go kind of make the rounds um, and, and they won't get used and abused here mm-hmm. that's a big thing too is you know it's hard for anyone no matter how good they are not to be that's why uh, Undertaker thing was so cool because he only saw him once a year if you saw him every, yeah. every week you get you know it's, you get tired of him no matter how good they are someone's like you know maybe on, uh, William is that William Morey on the line and we had some problem with some of the phone calls so sorry for people that's been trying to call in yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's all right, dude. I, I'm, I'm just cool with uh, listening in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Israel, was there any more uh, questions from the board? I'd like to ask Sean a question. Well, go right ahead. In your opinion, is TNA going to be dead in a year? Oh my God, we did this. This is like the. I feel like the family that's standing over Grandpa's corpse. You know, the life support system going. Really, is he still? Uh, we're still coming here every week to see Grandpa. <laughs> he hasn't opened his eyes in four years. Um, you know, I'm looking at. A, so, what to say? They seem to have. Let me say this. They seem to have an endless infusion of money. So will they be gone in a year? I don't know. Should they be gone in a year? Yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> they should have been gone two years ago. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I don't go back as far as people say, oh, you know, five years ago they should have been gone. No, they were, you know, they were trying to get the right talent in place, and, you know, they didn't have the skill as the other guys did for, you know, writing their product and, but you know they had they had the right names and they were changing the product sufficiently when they had to. But the last yeah the last year or two it's it's uh, something's got to happen there and um, it, it can't go on forever like this one would think. Um, that guy's got a lot of cash though, so who knows? Mm-hmm. Do you what do you think of uh, the odds of the the Jarrett promotion? Uh... You know, becoming anything. Well, I think the odds of any promotion now are are stacked against them because you don't have the element of control. If this was 1984, and I know it's not, I know it's not all the 19 year olds that are throwing shit at their monitor right now. I know it's not. But if it were, you had the element of control. You could set up somewhere in the country and be the only game in town. Um. You are immediately, right now today, if you're to start a company with TV, I'm not talking about indie feds that don't get exposure. I'm talking about starting something with TV. You're immediately the lemonade stand that's competing with Coca-Cola because it's the same playing field. You're in the same stores right away. And it takes a lot of money to make something successful. I, I, we just shot a breaking kayfabe with uh, Shane Douglas. Mm-hmm. And we talked about um, his startup. 
And the question I had for him is, I said, don't, don't you realize that anyone you develop from the ground floor and make and invest a lot of time in, you've got a finite amount of time with that person before someone waves a contract and they're gone. So you either have to pony up the cash to keep them, and I don't know how as a startup you'd be able to do that. I mean, that was you saw you, there was ECWs down. But the thing with ECW had going for it though was that people had a maniacal, you know, uh, Jonestown like loyalty to Paulie. So if you could have just got the damn checks to clear, uh, people probably would have stayed for half the money that they were being offered in WCW, mm-hmm. um, and people did, um, but they weren't getting paid eventually. Um, unless you had that kind of loyalty, it's going to come down to money. And anybody you develop and any exposure you get for anyone and anyone you make a borderline superstar, unless you can throw, you know, $800,000 a year at them, they're going to go somewhere else. So I don't know. I don't know if any startup could ever. The best we can hope for, I think, is one big major and then a competitive handful that compete with each other, that TNA, if you know, God knows what will happen over there, if they can turn it around. TNA competes with Ring of Honor, competes with um, uh, uh, Shane's company. They, I don't know if they have a temporary name or not, the Classic Wrestling Federation. I don't know if that's going to stay. But, this um, is uh, Global Wrestling? Or global I thought it was, class, it, it was classic, classic Wrestling Federation. I don't know. Maybe they changed already. But, um, if you could have a competitive handful, four or five, um, that can do interesting things, uh, swap talent there. And then you've got the WWE, which is kind of its own thing. They're, you know, got their eye on movies and all this other stuff. So it's a very different animal. So you kind of keep that separate, have some good, uh, some good, uh, what do they call triple A league uh, action going on. I don't mean Mexican. I mean, yeah, okay, baseball. Like, analogy there. Yeah. yeah. It's a, actually, it's a global force wrestling is the, is the name. Okay. And, uh, the webs. It was it was weird. I did read one of the things, and they said um, that it wasn't going to just be like uh, WWE and TNA, where it's just matches. It's going to be like I, I guess it's going to be like a reality show. I'm not really sure, but I just thought it was very odd that uh, they were like saying, you know, it's not just going to be wrestling matches. Like a lot of wrestling fans are just like, oh man, it's just too much <laughs> wrestling on this wrestling show. I wish there was a wrestling that had less wrestling. Well, I'm not really sure if that's the way to go, but who knows? It is, it is projected to be very, very different based on what Shane said. Mm-hmm. You'll see. Yeah. Well, I am interested. I'm always interested in a new uh, promotion. So we'll find out. So why do you start one? Start a wrestling promotion? Yeah, for God's <laughs> sake. See, people come in as their favorite horror character. You, know, you wouldn't pay to see, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon versus King Kong. <laughs> that, now, now, now we're talking. So it'd be like do it as an, do it as an animated series, like the Celebrity Deathmatch deal, and, and uh, all right, all right. That's, uh, that sounds pretty good. Pretty sure I, you could lock down Lawrence Harvey for you know the Fed. <laughs> yes, yes. I did. I did have a wrestling match at a at a horror convention where where uh, Mr. Lawrence Harvey of Human Centipede Two was uh, was helping me out, and I won that match. By the way, it's on YouTube. Yeah. Jack's favorite scream queen. Hmm. Wow, that's uh put me on the spot here. My favorite, uh, Linnea Quigley. From oh, okay, the classic. That's the uh, you're going you're going old school. Yeah. What would what would yours be? Oh boy. Uh, let's see. Mark Patton. <laughs> Who did you say? Mark Patton, which uh, he was uh, from uh, Night Rental Street Part 2. It's kind of funny because he considers himself the male. I'll say Heather Langenkamp because nobody even knows what she's doing now. I do. I've interviewed her many times. Where, where is she? Uh, she, had, she actually just put out uh, an, a uh, documentary. Uh, my name is Heather, I think. And it's, it's, hmm. it's I am Nancy. I am Nancy. And it's uh, it's about how... So everyone really thinks of uh, Freddy Krueger, and they kind of uh, overlook like uh, the the victims or the heroes of those films. And it's it's oh, interesting. 
It sounds like my enhancement talent show we were talking about earlier. <laughs> It's been Everyone talks about Piper. No one talks about Frankie Williams. God damn it! I'd have to go with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Hmm. That's a good one too. We've not had we've not had Jamie Lee Curtis on the show. I'm probably guessing she wouldn't do it, but you never know. I guess you would well, ask that. The thing about about uh, Heather Langenkamp in in um, Nightmare on Elm Street. I remember being a young lad myself when the film came out. And because of the clothing she was dressed in, it was hard to really ascertain whether she had a formidable rack or not. Mm. It was. Uh, I did a uh, a few panels with the ladies of Elm Street, and I've done ones with the with Scream Queens. And uh, it came the the wardrobe came up in a few of those, and um, I believe she said that the uh, the movie studio picked her wardrobe, and she really hated it. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I, I well, you've seen her in person. Jack, how, how's the rack? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know if there's been any uh, quote unquote enhancement, mm-hmm. but enhancement talent. But yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> the enhancement roundtable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a good show. The screen queens that have had their breasts augmented. <laughs> you realize we started this show talking about Roddy Piper and his contributions to the business, and now we're talking about. Heather Langenkamp's uh, potential uh, input. Yeah, I think, that, I think that is a that is a good timeline. Just, Andrew, what were you saying? I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I know back in the days I had the forehead VCR. I was so happy. I could pause it and freeze frame that pool scene, you know, when she gets pulled under in the bathtub. And then mm-hmm. I find out when I get older, it wasn't even her. Yeah, yeah. Man. I figured that, though. <laughs> Yeah, she was, uh, no, oh, anyway, that was, uh, if anyone wants to check those out, those are up on YouTube, the, the different panels. And they are very good. It was funny, there was, uh, there was, it's, it's a weird, I'll just say this quick story, sorry to interrupt you, but it's, um, I forget which one, it was one of the, one of the people from, from, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, one of the girls, and she, it came up about, um, about, uh, the fans and some of the creepier ones, and one of them had been stalked for a while, and he attacked her, and, um, uh, it, it was trying to rape her basically, and her husband saved her. Mm-hmm. And earlier in the in the show, um, earlier in that panel, they had talked about how um, a lot of those movies, the um, they would have the bad girls kind of dressed like you know sexually, and they would get killed. And it was kind of asking the questions in these movies if what you're wearing, you know, makes you do whatever. And then let Heather Langkamp, after she told this other woman, told this like you know herring this awful story about like almost being raped. She's like, I told you you shouldn't have uh, been wearing that. You were just asking for it. And I just, it was very funny, but at the same time, it's like wow, she was actually almost raped, and they're just uh, making. Was she was she joking? <laughs> she was almost really, but the other one, well, she was joking about uh, you know you deserved it, but it, I, it was an odd joke I think to make about an actual experience of someone being attacked. Yeah, it seemed like a really poor time to do that. <laughs> yes, but uh, she laughed. But uh, I guess uh, yeah. I don't know what else you would do. Just do a storm off, I suppose. <laughs> she must have been spending way too much time in the editing room in the uh, the girls of the horror movies are the real stars documentary. Perhaps she hadn't seen the light of day in a few days and needed to. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, where are those clips? I like I like to look at those. You hosted them. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, the they call moderator. Let's see, hosting sounds cooler. But yeah, there is um. Jordan, maybe uh, you can come host you shoot. Can I get off that fucking show already or what? Can you take this over I, for me? I will do it. I would love to do a you shoot. Pick a guy. I'll do it. I'll I'll film one here with a uh, with a uh, Duke of Dorchester. I found out he lives not far from me. <laughs> he needs something to sell. Okay, Jack. we do we do have to sell these, Jack. <laughs> I would buy it. I'm, I'll buy my own. <laughs> How many copies would you buy? Uh, I don't know too many people. Not that I want to give gifts to. But yeah, um, actually, you would. Um, they're on my regular YouTube page. It has all the in your head stuff. But I've been uh, I made two different YouTube accounts because uh, people are fickle. Some of the wrestling people I'll put up a horror thing. They're like, "What is this? This is not, this is not wrestling." And so I made a, a new a new uh, YouTube page, and it's youtube.com slash without your head, and uh, all the horror. How much crossover is there in that market? You think the you know, the horror film people and the wrestling people? There's actually quite a bit. I'm I was surprised when we when we started getting into the horror uh, convention, how <laughs> many um, how many people who like horror movies also like wrestling and uh, and vice versa. 
Yeah, it, I, I do think that they all kind of live in the same wheel. I think Kiss is in there, too. Kiss, mm-hmm. horror films, and wrestling. You know, the, you, the guys that are tough to get dates. That whole wheelhouse right yeah. there, I think I, it's all the same. Thing. I think the only thing that would go closer hand-in-hand hand with wrestling would be, like, pornography. So. <laughs> That'll be our next. Oh, that, you go to a porno convention, you, you see all the people from the wrestling convention. <laughs> That goes hand in hand with the world, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one wants to admit it, but there, it's weird because um, when I'm at the horror thing and like with Piper's era, plus he was in They Live, which is a classic movie. Um, but you expect people to know him and Hulk Hogan. But uh, they'll have guys like Jake the Snake, who again, that's a big name guy, but still not not quite as mainstream as the other two. But they'll they'll have big lines. Um, Sergeant Slaughter did really well at when I was at recently. Uh, Ox Baker, but again, he was in uh, he was in John Carpenter's Escape from New York. But uh, re- the wrestlers usually do really well at the at the horror movie conventions. I don't know if that's interesting. Was. Yeah, I've seen. I know the big one out here is Chiller, mm-hmm. the Chiller convention, and and they do stick a handful of wrestlers just kind of randomly. It's like you know Linda Blair. Uh, 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 Kane Hodder, The Iron Sheik, you know, and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, you're reading down the list, and they <laughs> do just kind of randomly stick wrestlers there. Yeah. yeah this last one was at Mad Monster Party, and um, some of the, some of the like, uh, like, I don't know what you want to call them, like the hardcore horror movie fans, they get mad, like, that they'll have wrestlers there, that they'll have, they have, like, William Shatner was there, and they're like, well, he's not horror, he's sci-fi. And, but, hey, he's uh, on Twilight Zone. Yeah, I agree. Well, they consider that sci-fi as well. Yeah, well. Well, a lot, a lot of them now are crossover, right? They're kind of like, they started out as horror, but it's almost like classic TV yeah. horror. I say the Fonz, I forget his name real, but the Fonz was there too. <laughs> Henry Winkler. Henry right. Winkler, yeah. Right. So I guess why not have Nikolai Volkov? Yeah. But yeah it was, um, actually, Ox Baker beat me up at that one. He he he's got a more terrifying look than any of the monster creatures, uh, any any of the uh, uh, horror movie uh, creatures. It was fun. Do you prefer? Do you prefer mm-hmm. the the slashers to the creatures? Because you said, like you said before, it could happen. So, yeah. so th- is that to mean that a Michael Myers or a Madman Mars is? Is scarier than like the cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. Of I think they're. Stud. I think they're scarier because I always did. Like, I did prefer uh, Jason Voorhees when he's kind of like a uh, like a retarded hillbilly guy, as opposed to when he's like a, a zombie. But right. I do also enjoy <laughs> the creatures. That kind of brings out like the kid in me. But I'm not necessarily scared by a. Uh, Okay. What about inanimate scary things like the stuff? Like the the villain is the yogurt. I am a huge fan of the stuff. I actually have I have a painted top hat which is very similar to uh to Buff Bagwell's hat, but it's all horror characters and the stuff is, is on that. And uh stuff mm. is an amazing film. Is uh, are you eating it or is it eating you? I can't really say stuff is necessarily a scary film, but it is a it's a it's an entertaining film. Well, it's it's the horror genre. It was covered extensively by Fangoria, from what I remember in my youth. Mm-hmm. Um, what else would fall into that category? The, the, the Halloween Three, the Silver Silver Shamrock Masks, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Christine. Right, right Christine. Christine. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I yeah, I don't find those scary at all. Mm-hmm. But I, I find them interesting yeah. because it could happen. Mm-hmm. The um, I could eat yo- I could eat yogurt that eats me from the inside. How do you know? Yeah, I just had yogurt before the show. Now I think about it. It's fucking rotten milk. You don't know what it's going to do to you. Exactly. The um, the silver shamrock one, uh, Halloween three. Uh, I think that one's really picked up uh, a new audience, like in recent times, because people weren't really big on it when it first came out because didn't have Michael Myers in it. But I think now people really see it as a standalone film, and uh, it has a whole new audience. It should have been. It had no business falling under the uh, falling under that umbrella. I don't know if you agree. I don't know if I'm being controversial right now. No. As your audience probably tuned out about 20 minutes ago, I went from being one of your most requested guests to the please never have him on again, <laughs> talking about the goddamn Silver Shamrock. 
I, I just the inter- oh, I forget the intro. Help me out here. The the star of, uh, of Tom uh, Atkinson. Tom, yeah, Tom Atkins. I just interviewed him at Mad Monster, and I asked him about that. And I asked the question like, "Does it build up a big audience?" And he looked at it and he said, "I don't give a shit if people didn't like the movie." You know? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> That is the thing that you'll notice if you, you know, I kind of have a foot in both businesses, the entertainment and this wrestling thing. Um, it's kind of more about the, the whether the check clears in the entertainment business. And in wrestling, people care so intensely about the work. And, you know, they need it. The participants, I'm talking about the wrestlers, you know, you, you know, talked about with such respect and reverence. It's almost God's work um, when you have to cover it. And then in wrestling, Tom Atkins is exactly right. But I don't care whether you like it. You know, yeah, I was paid. There was Done. A, Would you like me to sign a poster for you? The, the, the wrestling comment there, which I always find interesting, is um, they always expect you to, to, to love wrestling, which is great. You should, you know, love the sport and everything. But then if guys... If they almost like like it too much, like a DDP, then like they get ridiculed because they'll say like he w- he went back he went to WWE you know after WCW uh, he could have stayed out and made and had that big contract and they actually kind of like they people say like they kind of saw him as a mark because he went up and he hugged uh, McMahon and I just I find that very odd that that at one hand like you're supposed to you know absolutely love the business but on the other hand. You know, if you like it too much and you're seen, like, in a negative light. Um, I don't know. I, I think the guys that are most interesting were the ones that, for me anyway, when I hear them having come up in the 70s or before, and it was like, it was like circus or this. You know, it was a living. It really was a living for these guys. And it was a, a way to make money. And they learned the, the skill. They weren't standing in front of their mirror cutting um, fantasy promos from when they were five, like some of us, Jack. Um, mm-hmm. But with the guys that learned it as a community, you want to make a couple of bucks kind of thing. That's fascinating to me. And then they're, they're thrown on the road in Louisiana, doing ridiculous drives. And I mean, how many times must they have said, God, what am I doing? <laughs> Can I just work construction? You know the the guy with the, you know, the boyhood dream is is far less interesting to me than mm-hmm. the guys that were grinding out a living, drinking copious amounts of whiskey, and hoping you know for uh, a payday in the next city. Mm-hmm. Well, I do want to. Uh, we do have to get someone else here on the show, so I want to thank you for coming on, and uh, we'll have you back on anytime you want to come on. That drunk guy didn't call tonight. I'm so disappointed. What's I will. I will say we have had a few. Uh, I do have a little problem here with the uh, with the line. There's been a lot of missed calls, so I apologize. Oh, okay. For right calling in. And we... Okay. All right. Um, All right. Thank you guys. I always have fun. Yeah, I always do too. I thought you meant when you said the drunk guy didn't call, and you meant me because I am straight edge tonight. <laughs> Just tonight. Oh, tonight. Yes. Tonight, good. Mm-hmm. It, it, and 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 what a difference, Jack. <laughs> yes, I believe last episode, uh, last time we had you on, I think I drank a, like a fifth of a uh, bourbon during the interview. Well, you, you need to when I talk for an hour and a half. <laughs> I don't think that one went like three hours. <laughs> sort of. Gentlemen, thank you very much, as always, supporters of our company, and you have great fans, very dedicated, loyal listeners that I tend to enjoy. Very cool. We enjoy having you on, and everyone should take check out Kayfabe Commentary. Uh, I believe it's Kayfabe, Commentaries dot com. But you know, I think uh, a great place to to watch the the DVDs, and I have noticed a lot of people talk about this, is getting them off uh, WWN Live. WWN Live. Yeah, it's it, that's on demand. Yeah, I guess I should uh, you know hour and a half here. Great company spokesman. Uh, if you haven't given a plug once. WWN Live. That's our on demand channel. You can go on there, and it's not a rental. You you own that stream as long as you keep your free membership active there. It'll always be active uh, in your queue. You can watch whatever you purchase there as many times as you'd like. The only difference is you're not owning the physical DVD. Then there's some old farts like myself that like owning the physical DVD, and then you know we have that for you too. And coming very soon to pay per view actually will be a line of kayfabe commentaries produced programming. You're getting an exclusive here, so your local cable or satellite provider will have some of our content 
on pay-per-view as well. Oh, excellent. Looking forward awesome. to that. I myself do like owning the. As I look to my right and have a, uh, a stack of uh, DVDs to me, I do uh, as well like owning the actual physical DVD. But I know a lot of people... I think it's a, it's a generational thing, man. Yeah, I think so. A lot of people just uh, like to watch it right on their computer, and that's cool, too. So you can you offer both. And you can do that. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. All right. I'm in there. I'm in there. I'm in your head. That's right. Cheeky money is in your head, and there is nothing you could do about it except tune in and listen.